Due to Hurricane Katrina, the levee failures that flooded New Orleans, and the actions of the Louisiana legislature, New Orleans, four years after the storm, has a variegated and sometimes confusing collection of public schools and public school governance. All of the post-Katrina public schools in New Orleans, whether they are a part of the Arlene's Parish School Board, the Recovery School District, or independent, charter, or traditional, all have been influenced by the history of public education in this city, and all are part of a grand opportunity to reshape a city by providing quality education for all children. Public education is an anvil upon which a good many hammers have been worn out. A weary New Orleans public school superintendent, William O. Rogers, wrote these words in his 1884 annual report. Then he went on to complain about the impossibility of satisfying all of the personal opinions and educational theories of the many thousands who are interested in the results. Our organized system of public schooling was only 43 years old when William O. Rogers made his comments. It certainly hasn't gotten any easier, as was echoed 100 years later by Dr. Everett Williams, the superintendent in 1991, whose epilogue reads, There is no issue in our country more complex and more fervently debated than public education, and there is no shortage of opinions on how to educate a child. Many of the issues facing public education 168 years ago, or even 100 years ago, are remarkably similar to those facing schools today. When the first public schools in New Orleans were organized in 1841, they could not even call themselves the public schools of New Orleans. My research with uh, Crescent City Schools started through a conversation with Joe Logston. I had been working on aspects of education in New Orleans, especially uh, African American education. And Joe approached me about doing a joint project on the entire history of the school system from the mid 19th century you know, to the present. Yeah. Louisiana, despite its so called exotic origin, you know, Spanish, uh, you know, French influence, uh, it was a deep south you know, state. And agriculture ruled supreme throughout much of the 19th century history you know, of the state. So that is important because as a commercial agricultural you know, society, citizens did not put much uh, of value on widespread you know, education. Most of the sons and, and of the elite would need some education, but the masses would, would, would need you know, very little. So uh, persons who control the state were not interested in even uh, pushing private education and they were definitely not interested in pushing you know, public education. With that said, however, uh, Louisiana's first territory governor, uh, C.C. Claiborne, uh, did envision a, a, a somewhat uh, elaborate educational system, not so much because he was interested in educating the masses, but he was interested in educating these new uh, uh, Americans after the transfer in 1803 to you know, democracy. Early leaders, let's call them the, you know, the founding generation, believed that the individuals had to be indoctrinated, had to be taught uh, how to be good citizens. So republicanism had to be infused in students and children at a very young age. And the idea was that it would happen largely t two places, in the home and in the schools. The, the French-speaking people uh, resisted, uh, held on to their language and their custom, and uh, continued to agitate uh, against American control you know, and American you know, influence. As a result, many citywide initiatives got bogged down in these uh, uh, you know, conflicts. So the thinking was that if you could not bring the groups together, maybe it was best at least temporarily, to uh, divide the city along the linguistic and you know, cultural lines. When the first public schools in New Orleans were organized in 1841, they could not even call themselves the public schools of New Orleans. Five years earlier, bitter political and cultural rivalries between the Catholic French-speaking population 
and the largely Protestant and the more racially rigid Americans who came after the Louisiana Purchase divided New Orleans into three separate municipalities, all extending from the Mississippi River to Lake Pontchartrain. In 1841, Governor Andre Roman signed legislation telling the municipalities to organize and open public schools. Municipality number three, an area downriver of Esplanade, gets credit for the first school, located at what was then Victory Street, we now know it as Decatur, near Marigny Street, an area now considered part of downtown. This first school opened on November 15, 1841. But municipality number three's claim would be short-lived, and the modest educational effort on Victory Street almost immediately was overshadowed by the aggressive Americans and the second municipality, now a part of what New Orleanians refer to as Uptown. They had started earlier, developed a stronger plan for a system of schools, and from the beginning heavily influenced the direction of public schools in New Orleans. On March 26, 1841, Mayor William Ferret signed Ordinance No. 159, in which the Council of Municipality No. 2 called for establishment and organization of public schools. Even though New Orleans had a sizable population of free people of color and enslaved blacks in 1841, when Governor Roman gave the green light to the municipalities to open public schools, the Legislative Act specified that schools were to be for white children. Meanwhile, another law in the books threatened that all persons who shall teach any slave in this state to read or write shall on conviction thereof before any court of competent jurisdiction be in prison not less than one month nor more than 12 months. While municipality number two celebrated Mayor Ferret's signing of the so-called birth certificate of education on March 26, 1841, the public accepted without a murmur the wording of the ordinance limiting the public schools to the children of white resident parents. New Orleans free black citizens and the enslaved were excluded. There were also some who were not even happy that all white children were being educated. In 1843, the president of the council commented that it seems to be the opinion of some few that it is not best for the whole community to be educated. They think that knowledge creates discontent and insubordination among those who are in humble life, and that they are best fitted for their stations when left in ignorance. Local political officials charged with starting a system of schools look to New England. Well, New England, even during colonial uh, times, believed in the value of education, and not just education for the elite, although that was important, but education you know, for the masses. So the idea of public funded education, what we would call university education, actually got its start in the New England uh, states, uh, especially states like Massachusetts and states like you know, Connecticut. So the reason why uh, leaders in New Orleans turned to New England, because they had been involved for several decades and a lot of the educational initiatives and innovation uh, emanated you know, from the New England uh, areas. Again, especially uh, Massachusetts under the noted educator uh, Horace Mann. Wasting no time, the Board of Directors of Public Schools of Municipality No. 2, many of whom had friends and family members in New England, contacted Horace Mann and Massachusetts for advice. Mann recommended that John A. Shaw, an effective educational leader, be hired to head the school system in New Orleans. When the first board of directors sent for John Shaw, they hoped that the school system's benefit may be so apparent that it may, in short time, pervade the whole state. The start of education in New Orleans in 1841, at least public education, had uh, far-reaching uh, significance you know, and influence. But Strangely, much of the influence was outside of the state. Uh, there were some efforts outside of the state uh, from the legislature as well as other municipalities to uh, support public education. But between 1841 
and uh, the start of the Civil War in 1861, very little was done outside of the city of New Orleans. But if you look at some of the influence outside the state, uh, specifically, uh, for example, Mobile uh, and uh, Galveston, you know, you see progress that you could link to some of the lessons learned in New Orleans. While John Shaw, a northerner, may have had tremendous personal problems with slavery, he kept quiet to get the job. Two years later, municipality number two reported 1,156 students in its public schools, officially noting that many came from the families of opulent and influential citizens. The municipality's public school director concluded, these public schools afford better opportunities for children acquiring a good practical education than the private ones. The following year, the Council of Municipalities No. 2, in its second annual report, made an observation that resonates the challenges of today. The surest way to destroy the usefulness of the public schools would be to countenance the idea that they are a public charity designed only for the poor. Predicting the lack of public support for public schools once they did not also serve children of the middle and affluent classes. At least one modern day controversy popped up early on under John Shaw's tenure. Even in the 1840s, prayers in the school ignited a major controversy. Shaw was a deeply religious man, but as a devout Protestant, he had little tolerance for the religious beliefs of Catholics and Jews. He mandated daily prayers, which angered the Jewish parents, and he required teachers to read passages from the King James Bible, which angered the growing Irish Catholic population, and he punished children who did not participate. By then, some board members had been trying to get rid of Shaw. Some were opposed to his mandate prayer in school. Others did not like the fact that Shaw was a Yankee and they wanted a Southern superintendent. The school prayer controversy was settled by the Council of the Municipalities declaring in 1851 that no religious service shall hereafter be introduced in the public schools. Shaw returned to Massachusetts. For those who witnessed the division of school authority after Hurricane Katrina, it is interesting to note that even though in 1852 a new city charter reunited the now four municipalities into a single city, the public schools continue operating what had become four separate school districts under four separate boards, the fourth having been the city of Lafayette. Later, when General Benjamin Butler and the Union Army occupied New Orleans in 1862, the Union General took the position that separate school districts were needlessly complicated and expensive and placed all public schools under a single authority, the Bureau of Education. In 1867, Louisiana Legislative Act 107 united the four public school districts into one system. Many people do not know that during the 1870s, almost one-third of the public schools in New Orleans were successfully integrated for four or more years. The success had less to do with the school board, but rather with the post-Civil War political structure and politically astute black Creole families who demanded education for all New Orleans children. Noted author George Washington Cable worked as a reporter in New Orleans, and in 1874, he visited the Lower Girls High School at 1140 Royal Street. Today, the house is better known as the most haunted house in New Orleans. The first desegregated public high school in the South during the early 1870s. While the young women quietly went about their lessons in December 1874 in their classrooms on Royal Street, outside, the forces of white supremacy grew. Supporters and members of the White League, which emerged from the Knights of the White Camellia, Louisiana's version of the Ku Klux Klan, surrounded the all-girls school, entered the building, and then evicted the black children, or at least the ones they thought were black, by force after the Civil War, uh, the racial lines were not as rigid as it would come 
as it would become during the period you know, of Jim Crow. And I'm referring to that when we talk about desegregated schools, then of course we're talking about whites attending the schools you know, as well. And uh, thousands of whites attended these desegregated schools with very little racial uh, you know, friction or you know, opposition. Uh, so for a brief period, uh, the desegregated schools you know, did work and, and will suggest to many that in the absence of legislation preventing it, uh, it would have continued uh, after, you know, 18, you know, after 1874. One of the founding members of the White League, Archibald Mitchell, who became a member of the school board in 1877, alleged that public education has greatly deteriorated since colored and white children were admitted indiscriminately into the same schools, and he immediately recommended segregated schools. Some of the extra costs of the separated schools appear to have been offset by reducing the salaries of teachers. The issues of race remained a constant factor over the years, showing itself in dilapidated buildings, unequal pay for African American teachers, and limited educational opportunities for generations of African American students. In 1902, Assistant Superintendent Nicholas Bauer sent his handwritten annual report to Superintendent Warren Easton, in which Bauer writes, In accordance with your request, I would respectfully submit this as my annual report for the session 1901-1902. About 15 handwritten pages later, at the end of his report, Bauer admits that he has visited few Negro schools, yet... That did not stop him from making some chilling observations, expressing the prevailing low expectations for black students. I realize from my limited observations that to teach the Negro is a difficult problem. His natural ability is of a low character, and it is possible to bring him to a certain level beyond which it is impossible to carry him. That point is reached in the fifth grade of our schools. Nicholas Bauer would become superintendent of the New Orleans Public Schools in 1923 and serve until his retirement in 1940. Bauer's admission indicates the school district's disinterest in and disengagement from the black segregated schools. Over the years, the superintendent's office appeared to have a limited involvement with day-to-day -day management through the Division of Administration of Colored Schools. In many ways, the schools serving African American students had to fend for themselves. This neglect created a need and opportunity for educators and parents to provide additional support and craft policies that worked for the children in those schools. This early version of site-based education management was a necessity in segregated black schools long before charter schools were conceived. It was necessary, we just didn't have things. There, was, there were things, but people just saw to it that we did the best. We all had PTAs. My mother was one of those front runners with Mr. Edgar Poirier's mother, Mrs. Poirier, and, and persons like that in all of the schools. It just raised money and the churches helped to raise money for the schools just to be sure that we had paper you know our books were terrible it was they were always second-hand books always and sometimes no books sometimes shared books and i can always remember how how i don't know why we didn't get books. We, we always had reasons why they, meaning the white kids, is that's what we would say. But we, we just didn't have books. And when we got books, we were so excited. Now, Booker T. Washington opened in the, uh, what, early 40s, I guess. And I got there in 48. And in 1948, it was like, like what, four or five years old, I guess, at that point in time. But the, the thing that that impressed me about it. Mr. Lawrence D. Crocker was the principal, and he was one of them old line principals. Well, this is my school. You don't tell me how to run it. You don't tell me what to do. 
And I remember Mr. Becker, who was the deputy superintendent at the point in time, came to the school to try to do something, and he told him, this is my school. If you can't uh, follow the rule, get out. Except for those who might have passed for white, public education would remain segregated until 1960. Six years after the Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal schools had no place and that separate schools were inherently unequal. After six years of legal proceedings and delay, A.P. Turo and the NAACP were successful in forcing New Orleans public schools to begin its token integration. Some members of the school board wanted to close the schools rather than accept integration. District boundaries were now used as a means to slow or halt integration. The number of transfers would be centrally controlled. For example, out of the 135 African-American children who applied to go to previously white schools, only four little girls were approved for the first year of integration. From then until now, with the exceptions of magnet schools, a child's neighborhood determined what school he or she could attend. On that very first day of public school integration in New Orleans, some white parents began removing their children from mixed schools, and families began to leave the city for surrounding parishes, as did many of the businesses who served them. The role of race and the erosion of the city's tax base and the role of race and the declining support for public education cannot be ignored. Speaking of the difficulties faced by board members in 1879, Superintendent William O. Rogers observed that it cannot reasonably be expected. That gentleman having no other interest than the gratuitous discharge of public duties, will be willing to assume positions of directors of public schools to the neglect of their private affairs when the only return is to bear the odium of wrongs which they did not create and which they cannot redress and to incur responsibilities which they are powerless to meet. Various communities and legislative efforts to improve public education over the years have reshuffled and reconfigured the boards. Sometimes we forget how many variations have been tried. In 1843, the city remained divided into municipalities under one mayor. Each municipality had a recorder who also served as the president of that municipality's council. The mayor the municipality recorder, and three members of the municipality council automatically served as members of the Public Education Board of Directors. In addition, each municipality school, in theory, were managed by 12 of the most intelligent and respectable fellow citizens, individuals selected from the different wards of the city. In other words, each municipality effectively had a school board of 17 members. When Union General Butler and his troops occupied New Orleans in 1862, he issued Military Order No. 6082 to get rid of the cost and redundancy of multiple school boards. In its place, he put a single, five-member Bureau of Education composed of members of his military government most of whom were involved in public education prior to the war. The mayor, also an appointee of the military authorities during the occupation, chaired the Bureau of Education. In 1864, following another reorganization, the board of directors increased from five to 16 members. Once again, City Hall continued to exert a tight control over the schools as the mayor and two members of the city council served on the board and the city council chose the remaining 13 members. Throughout the period of Reconstruction, political partisans engaged in a nonstop tug-of-war for control of local public education. In August 1865, amidst controversy, the city council reorganized the board and expanded it to 24 members with the mayor appointing all 24. Less than a year later, in July 1866, the city council devised a new school board plan. They kept the 24 member limit, now with city council members choosing all 24 members. 
During Reconstruction, there was upheaval in almost every aspect of government, and the new state legislature reconfigured the makeup of the board again. The law provided for a board of 11 members. The State Board of Education would control the board by selecting six of the 11 members, while the New Orleans City Council appointed the remaining five. In 1873, the members of the Board of Directors of the Public Schools of New Orleans jumped to 20 members, with the majority of the members still appointed by the State Board of Education. When Reconstruction came to an end in 1877, a new board of 20 members with four-year terms took over the management of the schools. Local authority was a bit stronger since the city council could appoint 12 members. The State Board of Education still had a powerful voice in New Orleans public education by appointing eight members. An all-new board of 20 members was appointed in 1884, and in 1888, the governor began making the eight state appointments. In 1906, the first time school board elections would give the city's voters and local politics the right and opportunity to elect 17 board members, one each from the city's 17 wards. The remaining three seats were held by the mayor, Martin Berman, plus the city's comptroller and the city's treasurer. Mayor Berman found that as he helped the schools and created jobs by building schools, his political power grew stronger. He wielded a powerful influence over the public schools through his ward-based political organization. In addition, Mayor Berman sent his children to the public schools, probably the last New Orleans mayor to have the confidence to do so. In 1912, the state legislature took action and dismantled the ward-elected school board and created a five-member school board to be elected citywide. At the state level, some may have believed that the popular Mayor Berman would no longer be able to control the board with his ward-based political organization, but they were wrong. The New Orleans public schools were officially separated from the city government as a result of constitutional amendments, which gave the school district its own funding source. And in 1916, the title, Board of Directors of the Public Schools of Parish of Orleans, changed to the more familiar Orleans Parish School Board and board members were given six-year staggered terms, so they could not be replaced at one time by political forces associated with one mayoral candidate or another. The change made to the board in 1916 lasted 72 years, until in 1988, a new constitutional amendment provided for a seven-member board with five of the members representing districts and two members running citywide. The often changing structure still was not settled. And while the present board configuration continues the seven-member board, it eliminated the at-large seats creating seven school board districts and changed the terms of office to four-year concurrent terms. Since that time, a whole new set of educational directors can be voted in every four years, directly affecting, even shortening, the tenure of superintendents. I would ask all stakeholders, all persons interested in public education today in New Orleans as well as in the future, to pay less attention to uh, govern, governance and governing uh, structure. It's, it's less about uh, structure as it is about equality of education in terms of parental involvement, quality teachers, you know, motivated students, sufficient you know, community resources, uh, teacher salaries, uh, you know, safe, clean, modern you know, buildings. Well, one of the things I always did was whenever I was at a school board meeting or hearing, I always sat at least 10 steps away from the microphone so I would have time to think. And in this particular meeting was a public hearing on the budget that was held at Rosenwald School, um, oh, I guess about 18, 19 years ago. 
And at that meeting, a parent said that he was from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he had recently moved to New Orleans, and he was shocked to find out how old the school buildings were. And he wondered how many of the buildings were, were built before the war. Uh, so as I approached the microphone, I, I um, leaned over and said, which war? So uh, everybody started laughing, and the, the gentleman said, World War II. So I immediately said uh, 61, because 61 of our schools had been built before World War II. So the school board president asked uh, what my answer would have been had the gentleman said World War I. So I said 17. And then he asked, well, he said, I know that's it, because I know we can't go back to the Spanish-American War. So I said seven. So he said, I know that's it, because I know we can't go back to the Civil War. And I said three. Uh, so so uh, the, the school buildings in New Orleans, uh, uh, at the point of Hurricane Katrina, uh, were 20 to 25 years older than the national average. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but the age of the buildings uh, is one of the major contributing factors uh, because uh, the oldest school currently in operation was constructed in uh, 1852, the old Carrollton Courthouse, which... Uh, in the past housed Benjamin Franklin High School, Lusher Extension, and now has Audubon Extension. In 1866, a reference is made to the condition of the public schoolhouses of this city, and the superintendent said that every dollar that can be spared, as long as it does not reduce the salaries of teachers, is urgently needed for the erection of new buildings and the repair of old ones. In addition, they were also too small and the light and ventilation defective. The board again complained that it had been many years since the city had made any provision for new schoolhouses, and the repairs of these old buildings take money away from the current expenses of instruction. The McDonald Fund was the financial legacy left to the school district by John McDonough. A man who owned slaves, but left a bequest for the building of schools for white and Negro children. The McDonald Fund is credited with paying for the construction of school buildings during the years of depression when the resources of the city have been prostrated in the general gloom. In reality, the McDonald Fund provided about a third of the cost of building these schools. Nevertheless, the McDonald School buildings were often the star facilities of the New Orleans system because funding for new construction was seldom available. The McDonald Fund helped with the construction of more than 30 schools and bequest by Frank T. Howard and Rudolph T. DeNeal built four more. After the 1879 construction of McDonald 5 and McDonald 6 for colored pupils, the superintendent claimed that ample provision has been made for the instruction of this class of our school children. William O. Rogers claimed that the instructional offering and the buildings for both white and black children were equal. He was as concerned for the convenience and comfort of teacher and scholar in all schools. In 1907, Warren Easton went so far as to brag that the children of New Orleans are fortunate in not being herded together in overcrowded classrooms. It was clear that the claims made by William O. Rogers and Warren Easton were neither accurate or truthful regarding schools for white students and more so for schools for African-American students. In 1913, even Superintendent Gwen admitted that practically all of the schools for Negroes are overcrowded. While the school board often provided inadequate buildings even for white students, African-American parents had to lead the charge to convince the school board to build school buildings for their children. In the 1905-1906 annual report, school officials calmly reported that construction was underway on a new Tommy LaFon school. 
The previous school building was destroyed by a fire and a race riot of a few years ago. The race riot reference was to the events that began on July 23, 1900, when an African-American man from Mississippi, Robert Charles, was struck by a policeman wielding a billy club. After the policeman drew his pistol, Charles drew his own and shot the policeman. Hunted and eluding capture for a week, Charles wounded 19 men and killed five before he was killed. The incident set off a wave of racial violence. Even the death of Charles did not stop a large mob who planned to burn a whole block of homes of African Americans near South Rampart and Forth. They planned to shoot anyone who tried to escape the flames. They soon decided they were not sufficiently armed and they changed their plans. The best memorial to one of the slain policemen, they decided, would be to burn Lafon School at 6 and South Robinson Street. It is said that the blaze from the three-story wood frame structure lit up the night sky in New Orleans. When the new Lafon School finally was rebuilt in 1906-1907 school year, it housed 1,046 Negro pupils. The new school for African American children finally came about as a result of mob violence. A 1927 Louisiana Weekly series on public schools reported that in 1926-1927 school year, Lafon housed 2,700 children. The huge enrollment made Lafon the largest elementary Negro school in the world. In 1933, another Louisiana Weekly investigation showed that the school had the largest enrollment of any Negro elementary school in the United States. By now, the school enrollment had grown to 3,533 children. It would take years for a program to provide suitable school facilities for African-American children. In the early 1900s, Mayor Berman found that encouraging school construction guaranteed both a grateful public and provided construction patronage job for his political supporters. 21 school buildings can be traced to Martin Berman's three terms as mayor. Only four of those schools were intended for black students. One slated to be closed because it was across from ballrooms, too close to a railroad depot, and in the midst of tenements, McDonald 13 was deemed suitable for African American high school students. But before they could move in, the name had to be changed from McDonald 13 to McDonald 35. In 1917, the first public high school for African Americans was squeezed into McDonough 13, a crumbling former white elementary school located in a noisy, aging commercial center at Rampart and Gerard. 35 was a run-down building. We used to call it old Pot Belly School because it was cold, but they were always shoveling trying to be sure to get the coals in just so the children could be warm. In a 1928 editorial, the Louisiana Weekly highlighted the school board's hypocrisy when it decreed there would be no more frame buildings. The Hoffman School, McCarty School, and the Tommy LaFon Annex, all serving black pupils, were of recent construction and all wood frame buildings. As the number of African-American students increased, the segregated schools became more overcrowded. At first, rooms were rented in adjacent buildings, and the instructional time was reduced so that the schools could be platooned. As the population began to grow, uh, more and more pressure to have African-American high schools came about. And so um, one of the pressure was, uh, from the community was to have a vocational school. Uh, there were, uh, in the tw 1920s or so, there were two vocational opportunities for white children. For boys, there was the Delgado Trade School, as it was known at that time. 
And for girls, there was the Bodwee Industrial School, uh, which was later replaced by Rob Wayne High School. Uh, that opportunity was there in the black community that was not a parallel opportunity. Uh, so there was a lot of pressure and a lot of struggle that eventually resulted um, in the construction of the Booker T. Washington High School and its opening uh, just before World War II. Right. My, my 35 high school graduation was at, at Booker T. Washington Auditorium. Beautiful. Everything was new and just gorgeous, and we were so pleased. Um, around the 1930s, uh, Landry Elementary School was in operation on the West Bank, and it began to add the upper grades for the high school grades, and uh, it eventually was converted into high school. That building later burned down, and um, a new Landry School was built, and uh, now that's, that's being replaced by, by new, new construction. Uh, as the pressure began to build, some other changes occurred. The old E.D. White School, which had been an elementary school and a high school, uh, was originally built as elementary, was converted into uh, the Joseph S. Clark High School. In addition to that, the old Crutchnet Elementary School in the White School system was converted into the Walter L. Cohn uh, High School, and then that was later um, replaced with the, with the new building that's, that's on the site right now. Um, most of those schools, with the exception of uh, McDonough 35, Booker T. Washington, uh, and Landry, um, all of the other opportunities for African American students at the high school level did not really surface until after World War II. Since World War II, there have been numerous issues that have affected the facilities in New Orleans. One issue is, is of course, the age of the buildings. Another big factor was, was technology. You know, some of our school buildings, in fact, some of the school buildings that were still in operation before Katrina were initially built before electricity was, was uh, being used. It was not that long ago where one 15 or 20 amp electric circuit could serve five or six classrooms because all they had was lights and maybe a, f a few fans. Uh, now you need maybe four or five 20 amp circuits for each classroom because of computers, because of... Um, of projectors and printers and all kinds of other electronic equipment, not include, not counting the uh, air conditioning system. Uh, another big factor is the population dynamics from a combination of the World War II baby boom as well as the rural to urban migration. And with the sudden influx of people from the country, combined with um, federal policy like FHA and so on, that made it easy for uh, especially the white citizens that were moving in to then move out to the suburbs in track housing and, um, and racially discriminatory uh, housing practices for the African American population that was moving in. It started separating the population by race in a way I don't think New Orleans really had before that time. You also had the construction related to the population, you had the construction of large public housing projects, the biggest of which was the Desire area. And that caused the necessity for, for large school plants in and around the, um, uh, those housing projects. And at, at this point, uh, with the redevelopment of them, you don't need as many schools so close to them. And of course, the big factor, the, the, the elephant in the room, is the whole question of, um, of the fact that going into World War II, uh, the school district was separated by, uh, by race. And you had inadequacies of schools, both in terms of capacity as well as quality of buildings, especially in the African American students. Co-education has been, been an issue, especially at the high school level because the school district lacked the funds to fully convert some of these schools. For example, John McDonough Senior High School, which was originally an all-girls school. When they um, became co-educational, they started putting industrial art shops in. All they really did was convert a couple classrooms on the first floor into shops, and they really did not have the kind of appropriate, adequate facilities that you should have, again, because of financing. As far back as 1843, barely two years old, 
the municipality number two schools realized that the state meager allotment of $2,300 for its public schools left the lion's share of the expense, $26,000, to the municipality. School officials tried to convince the state that stronger schools made a stronger city. They concluded that successful public schools brought prosperity to the municipality. The appeal fell on deaf ears. By 1879, William O. Rogers was more passionate in his arguments and met the issue squarely. Either the city can or cannot support a system of public schools. If there are sound reasons why it cannot do so, then the truth ought to be known and the consequences fairly and squarely met. Rogers also understood that people without children and parents of children in private schools might not recognize the benefits of living in a city with quality public schools. He wrote, Those who are taxed for the education of others are not always cheerful contributors, and their objections sound a note of alarm, the echoes of which vibrates through every schoolroom. New Orleans was growing, but the community seemed to think that a focus on economic development was sufficient. In 1915, the public school's annual report featured a section titled, Has New Orleans Spent Too Little on Its Public Schools? And it issued a challenge that went to the heart of the city's priorities. Municipalities should boast of how much they spend on public education rather than how low their tax rate is. Then in 1916, a constitutional amendment passed giving the school board the ability to levy a local tax its own taxing authority. It meant that the city of New Orleans was no longer responsible for establishing, supporting, and maintaining the public schools. Now, without the political clout of City Hall, the school board had to stand in a political arena and face its political problems alone. And members had to find ways to fund their own political campaigns, a probable source of conflict and competition among board members that has nothing to do with quality schools. Dr. Everett Williams, the first African-American superintendent for New Orleans schools, expressed his frustration about school politics at the end of his term. There is a tremendous amount of political pressure exerted on school administrators and school board members to favor certain vendors over others. History has shown that sometimes educational leaders have been able to withstand such pressures and make proper decisions as at other times they have sold the trust of their office to the highest bidder. Early on, educators also understood that there were other needs and influences outside the schools that had to be addressed for public education to succeed. For example, teachers saw hungry children, particularly in the factory areas around the city. Around 1911, the Chi Omega fraternity linked with the public schools to begin serving penny lunches to the children. A few years later, in 1919, Mayor Martin Berman donated a truck to send meals from a central location to the participating schools. In many cases, the lunch constituted the only full meal the children received. In a telling series of medical exams conducted in 1908, the medical department asked for a list of 2,003 students who were classified as backward children, children not performing well in school. It came as no surprise to Dr. Moss that 1,919 of the 2,003 children had hearing or vision problems, breathing problems, dental problems, or enlarged glands, an indicator of possible infections. The 1915 annual report documented the public school's proactive approach to a problem that today's school must confront again. 50% of the pupils entering the first grade never complete the eighth grade in New Orleans. Educators visited the home of every dropout. They learned poverty plays a conspicuous part in causing irregular attendance. They learned that a fruitful source of neglect for children is the addiction to the too free use of alcoholic drinks on the part of one or both parents. They learned about parents who are weak and who have lost control of their children. The school district reached a simple conclusion. These parents need to be educated in their duties toward their children. And the parents were more involved too, keep that in mind. 
you, you take a Dorothy Taylor and all of the parents are down her period of time. They, they pretty much saw what was going on in the school, they were in the school, they were participating, and they were part of what was going on. And, and there was an overlap from the community to the school, which as, as time passed, that began to kind of fade away a little bit at a time. Till all of a sudden you had children in school and no parents. The public schools in New Orleans are here to serve everyone. And perhaps Warren Easton said it best in 1908. The school must provide proper training for the unfit as well as the fit, for the slow as well as the bright, for the unwilling as well as the willing. That is the challenge for New Orleans. Where will we go from here? Last year, I had one fourth grade class with 35 students in that class. On this year, I had two fourth grade classes with only 19 children in the class, and that made a big difference in the students' performance. Is school better now, or was it better before Katrina? Better now. Why? Because we learn, we learn all types of new things, like reading 180, math, deeper math, and we got a playground. We're learning new things this year than we learned last year. Because they're helping us for the new test and they want us to pass and they want us to get better grades. So I can have a better education. My name is Al Kennedy with the Midlow Center for New Orleans Studies at the University of New Orleans. Many of the materials used in this film came from the Orleans Parish School Board Collection that is housed in the Louisiana and Special Collections Department of the Earl K. Long Library at UNO. This is a very rare collection, perhaps one of a kind in the United States. It was started in 1982, and if all the boxes were put end to end, it would extend the length of more than five football fields. That's, a, that's all New Orleans public school history. Now the important part of this collection is that all the material that was placed here prior to Katrina was saved. While many homes and schools suffered, this collection remained intact and allowed us to present a history of the public schools from 1841 because all of the records were available. So we're asking you, those of you who were involved with public schools, those of, those of you who taught in them and attended them and worked in them, to consider leaving your materials and donating them to the University of New Orleans to be a part of this important collection. For more information, call the reference desk of the Louisiana and Special Collections Department in the Earl K. Long Library at 280-6544. Thank you.